Good morning and welcome to the third meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2019. We have apologies this morning from Anas Sarwar and can I welcome Daniel Johnson who is attending both evidence sessions this morning. Can I please ask everyone in the public gallery to switch off their all electronic devices or turn them to silent so they don't affect the committee's work this morning. Item number one is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items four, five and six in private? Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much. Item two is the section 22 report, the 1718 audit of Community Justice Scotland. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning. Paul Johnson, Director General Education, Communities and Justice. Neil Rennick, Director for Justice. And Donna McKinnon, Deputy Director and Head of Community Justice Division of the Scottish Government. I understand that Paul Johnson would like to make an opening statement. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to provide evidence this morning to the committee in response to the Auditor General's report on Community Justice Scotland. As Director General for Education, <coughs> Communities and Justice, I am the Portfolio Accountable Officer for the Scottish Government. Sponsorship responsibility sits within the Justice Directorate led by my colleague Neil Rennick and in particular Community Justice uh, sits within the uh, division that is uh, the responsibility of my colleague Donna McKinnon. The Accountable Officer for Community Justice Scotland is its Chief Executive Karen McCluskey. Community Justice Scotland is the national body for community justice that was launched on the 1st of April 2017 following the Community Justice Scotland Act 2016. It aims to create a more robust and effective system of community justice across Scotland based on local planning and delivery by a wide range of partners. The Auditor General's report relates to the first full year of operation of Community Justice Scotland. We fully acknowledge and recognise the Auditor General's findings. The report acknowledges that some actions have been taken to address the issues raised, including the recruitment of four new board members, uh, and a recruitment round has now been launched for a new permanent chair, and that is currently open for applicants. Both the chief executive and the current acting chair have also confirmed that actions have been taken within Community Justice Scotland in response to the report, uh, including the appointment of a deputy chair and the strengthening of financial capability. There is wider learning to be taken from this report including the actions that are needed when our public appointments process do not identify sufficient numbers of board members. And the report also reminds us of our need to work tirelessly to ensure that our public body boards have both the necessary skills and the necessary diversity. Community Justice Scotland is a relatively new organisation. It has a key role within our justice system. And over its first uh, 20 months of operation, it has already made progress on a number of areas. And I hope we'll have the opportunity to uh, describe and discuss some of that progress, including the training and developing of uh, a wide range of community justice workers and uh, very widespread public engagement and communication. I'm happy to take questions on the actions that have been and uh, are being taken in response to the Auditor General's report. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. I'm going to ask Colin Beattie to open questioning for the committee. Thank you, Vera. Um, Mr Johnson, I'd like to ask you just a very straightforward question. I mean, given the fact that this committee over a number of years now has been expressing concern over governance uh, as a result of various reports that have been brought forward by the Auditor General, um, how did your eye go off the ball in this one? Well, I wouldn't accept that, that uh, my eye went off the ball. I think we are looking at an organisation that um, has, as I mentioned in my opening statement, already made real progress in its first 20 months of operation. But whenever a new organisation is established, we hand over uh, responsibility to a new board for it, for it to discharge its functions, and we seek to support the board in discharging its functions. Uh, we can certainly describe the uh, very wide range of support that we have provided Community Justice Scotland in its setup, 
um, and uh, my colleague Neil has been at the forefront of providing that support over the 20-month period. And I think that has helped the board uh, get established. Um, it's helped it get ultimately a, a clean audit report in that the accounts are unqualified. But of course, um, not everything is uh, not everything is perfect. Uh, we did have issues. We have had challenges, and it's very important that we um, that we take those on board and that we learn lessons from it. When did you become aware that uh, the board membership was not compliant? Well. Let me um, explain a little bit about the acts, or say a little bit about the acts requirements in relation to board members. I think it is quite important that this is. Answer Colin Beatty's question first, and then elaborate. What, I think he asked when. Well, well, what, well, my point is that the uh, board memberships, the, the the act does make provision for the situation that we've got. So, so the important point is that the situation is not non-compliant. Um, that, that's the important qualification. The Act states that the number of board members should be uh, between five and eight. However, there is a provision in the Act that anticipates the possibility of vacancies in membership. So what we uh, have done when we recognised that the initial recruitment process um, only produced four members was rely on the vacancy provision in the Act and uh, appointed another individual to act as an advisor to the board. Um, perhaps my colleague Neil would like to say a little bit more about those uh, provisions and about the steps that we, that we took, if that would be helpful for the committee. Yeah, just to reassure the... the sorry, of course. Clarification sorry. here. I mean, that is not what the Auditor General says in our report in terms of uh, the Act. I mean... The Auditor General quotes here at the Act states that Community Justice Scotland consists of a member appointed by the Scottish Ministers to chair the Community Justice Scotland and at least five, but no more than eight other members. There, there's no mention of any qualifications or, or variations in here. Well, I'll turn you to paragraph 12 of Schedule 1 to that Act where uh, Parliament stated that the validity of anything done by Community Justice Scotland is not affected by a vacancy in membership. So we took advice and uh, on the basis of uh, that advice concluded that the board could continue to properly discharge its responsibilities on the basis that there was a vacancy. Our intention had been when initially recruiting to um, appoint up to eight members. But you'll appreciate that we must conduct a rigorous public appointments process, and indeed that process was scrutinised at all points by um, the, uh, the advisor uh, from the uh, Commissioner's office. The process did only produce four appointable members. We therefore, made, uh, we therefore relied on that provision around vacancies in membership pending a further appointment round. Are you saying that the Auditor General's report is incorrect? Well, the Auditor General correctly quotes the provision of the Act, but uh, I'm drawing. I'm, I'm simply tr seeking to explain the uh, other provision can that I enabled ask, us to ask, proceed. Do you accept the Auditor General's report? I accept that. I accept the conclusions and the uh, findings of her report. In particular, I accept that um, there was a need to strengthen and increase the number of board members, and part of my. Uh, learning, our learning from uh, this process and from considering carefully the Auditor General's findings is that we could have taken earlier steps to recruit additional board members. Could I just ask you for a yes or no? Do you accept the Auditor General's report and the criticism in that report uh, based on um, paragraph 5? and indeed six of that report. Well, I think it's important that I do provide the qualification around the legal basis that the Scottish Government had uh, for proceeding. So I accept it subject to what I think is a, a necessary qualification. There was a legal basis. Your qualification effectively means that the Auditor General's report is incorrect or incomplete. If it's maybe helpful to the, the committee just to, to, to clarify and reassure you, there was a, a, a full 
uh, public appointments process undertaken, as, uh, as the Director General has said, uh, that set out and asked to, to seek eight members for the board. So that full process was, uh, was followed. It is the only process that we have for recruiting members onto uh, public appointment boards. Uh, an assessor from the Commissioner's office was part of that, that process uh, and was assured that that was followed appropriately. Um, as the Director General has said, unfortunately, that process, although it got a large number of uh, responses and a number of people were, were interviewed, only four people were identified as being appointable through that, uh, that process. So the Auditor General is right that in terms of the, the, the Act, our process only identified uh, four members against the, the five. The action that we took then in response to that was... Uh, to check the legislation to ensure that the, the work of the, the board would continue to be valid with four members. And we also took action to place uh, an expert uh, advisor onto the board with experience of um, community justice delivery based on an assessment of the skills mix and the, the skills that were required following that appointment process. I think I have to take it that uh, based on what you say, you don't actually accept the content of that report. No, I, I accept that it correctly reflects the, the legislation as uh, as it is and that we only identified mm. four members, but that, the, uh, as the Director General said, we ensured that uh, we were that the, the actions of Community Justice Scotland would be valid under the law, even though it only had four members, and we ensured that there were five people around the board in addition to the chair by placing a, an expert advisor reflecting the skills mix that, uh, that was assessed with, uh, with the chair. Thank you, Mr. Alex Neil. Can I ask Paul, what is the definition of a vacancy? Well, I, as, to the best of my knowledge, the Act does not specifically define vacancy. Um, as I mentioned, we took advice on this matter and concluded that in circumstances where we had sought to fill up to eight posts and had only filled four of them, we could proceed on the basis that there was a vacancy. I would have interpreted a vacancy to be where somebody has been serving on the board and then steps down from the board and that creates a vacancy. Um, a vacancy isn't created because you can't find the right number of people for the board. So I think the use of the word vacancy is misapplied here. Um, did you, when the Auditor General was doing a Section 22 report, did you explain to the Auditor General staff what you've explained to us in terms of a vacancy. I'm not sure if we did have the uh, opportunity or if we did take the opportunity to explain that, and I think it's a very fair point. My colleague Neil may wish to say more on yeah. that. Yeah, we, we met at an earlier stage with, uh, with Audit Scotland, and the, the discussion focused on the actions that we had taken to, to place new uh, board members and the fact that at that stage we were just about to, to appoint the uh, additional members onto the, the board. So the focus of that discussion was on the remedial actions that we'd taken. Uh, I, I, I made the error of not uh, advising them of the legal basis in which we had done, so that wasn't part of the discussion that we had with uh, Audit Scotland. That well, there was well, a, given the report, that was basis. a fairly major error, was it not? Uh, in terms of clarifying, but uh, obviously we don't uh, uh, we don't share our, our, uh, uh, the, the legal advice that we received, but no, we don't followed share the that legal advice. advice. But surely you should have explained to the Auditor General your interpretation that this was legal because of a vacancy. It, certainly, I would have uh, clarified if there had been any question of whether the, the, the actions of uh, Community Justice Scotland were uh, not valid. I would have been happy to clarify the case that we ensured that they were valid. Just to be clear, when the Minister signed off the recruitment exercise for the board, uh, did that paper suggest the recruitment of eight members and the issue was you couldn't find eight qualifying members vis-a-vis -vis the skill set you were looking for? That's correct. That uh, In the original um, uh, advice, uh, in the original submission to ministers, it was on the basis that we would seek eight members. That was the basis in which it was advertised and in which we, we sought to recruit members. Um, the process only identified uh, four members. We, we don't have any other process in which to identify people. Consideration was given whether or not we could uh, delay starting the work of the, the, the board. 
but the existing community justice authorities were already uh, winding down. There were staff being recruited into community justice uh, Scotland, and clearly they have an important role to, to fill. So we had to ensure whether or not we could allow the organisation to, to start with four members, and we tried to uh, remedy the, the, the smaller number of members by adding in an advisory member with significant experience of community justice. Uh, Our only other option would have been to delay the, uh, the, uh, the start of the organisation until a full recruitment round could be progressed. You then recommend to the Minister there should be a further round to try to recruit additional members and that that should be done reasonably quickly? Yes, it was discussed at the, the time what the right time scale was. Obviously, having just gone through a recruitment round and only identified four members at that stage, there was a question of whether another recruitment round on the same basis would uh, identify uh, more members. A decision in was taken in dialogue with the chair that it was best to allow a number of months for the, the, the board to operate and assess what its skills requirements were and then run a further, rec a further recruitment round to bring the board up to, to, full, uh, to full strength. It would be helpful if the committee could get a copy of the relevant uh, recommendations to the ministers uh, in both the first round and the, and the second round to see actually what happened. My final question is, um, on at this stage, is uh, has any attempt been made to recruit members to the board who have actually been through the community justice system? Or is, is it all people in suits? No, it was very deliberately intended in the initial recruitment round and again in the, the second recruitment round to recruit people with uh, lived experience of the justice system. One of the, the members who was recruited initially uh, has uh, lived experience of the, the, the justice system through a family member. But no people who had directly themselves been at any time through the system? They certainly weren't excluded. I, I, I can't no, say whether any of the members question. have that. Is there that. any attempt made to recruit such yes, people? Yes, the, the, there was specifically in the criteria, uh, there was a, 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 a sought for people who had experience of the community justice system uh, as people who had been through it uh, as uh, and, accused of and, crime. And, and as of including the new recruits, is there anyone now in the board who has had direct experience of being through the community justice system? I think that would fall into information that I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be able to reveal if Could I did. Could you write to us and let us know, please? Uh, I, again, I wouldn't want to commit to, to release information. I'm not sure I'm able to, but I'll certainly uh, check what I can reveal. Well, it's a simple question, you know. Um, Mr. Rennick, okay. can you check if you're allowed yeah. to give us those details? And if you right. are, then you'll yeah. furnish us with those. Right. Thank okay. you very much indeed. Willie Coffey. Convener, and good morning to you. I wonder if you could, uh, if we could give you an opportunity to give us a flavour of where we are now. I'm sure we'd all agree that this organisation has made a bit of a shaky start. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, where are we now with the organisation in terms of the audit principles that we're interested in? Uh, structures, governance, audit and risk and all of that. Is that working? Is it up and running? Are you confident that it is and it's delivering what it needs to do for the period ahead? Very happy to say more about that. Um, yes, I think it's clear that the board have taken steps to engage very actively with the auditors and take on board the recommendations that have been made. So in particular, um, the board now have um, a full complement of members with eight new members coming on board. Um, my understanding is that only yesterday the board agreed that a deputy chair should be formally appointed. And um, I think that is very sensible in light of some of the learning from this audit report. Um, they also have in place the, their strengthened uh, committee structures, given that the operation of the committees was one of the matters that was uh, referred to by the Auditor General. Um, they have been operating as a as a full board with a with with a I'd say a high degree of effectiveness. Um, their minutes are published on their website, and we can see from the minutes that the board, yes, have been taking time to get established, but have been dealing with the issues around uh, planning, strategy, uh, finance, people, and risk that we would expect of a board. Um, but certainly the actions that have now been taken by the board should uh, serve to strengthen their governance. And we in the Scottish Government and the sponsor team in particular will be seeking to uh, support the board very closely over the coming uh, weeks and months so that the learning from this uh, first audit is uh, fully taken into account and uh, helps ensure that the organisation has got very strong foundations in terms of its governance. So, but would you say, though, Paul, that the, the problems that we've had so far, though, with the, the smaller numbers on the board and the, 
the issue with the chairman and the chair that has had no impact in the overall delivery of the, the service that we plan to roll out. You, you talked about uh, a robust, effective delivery for community justice and local planning and the, the working with a wide range of partners and so on. Surely, surely it must have had some kind of impact in your your hopes for a, a clean rollout of those those objectives. Well, I noted that Grant Thornton, the external auditors themselves, in discussing the operation of the board, stated that uh, despite some challenges in terms of the absence of a permanent chair, they said, and I quote, there did not appear to be a significant adverse impact on board decision making. So this board has uh, functioned, notwithstanding some of the challenges that it's experienced. Even more importantly, we can point at this 20 month point to some real successes of the organisation in seeking to deliver its core objectives. And I'm sure that's what uh, the members of the committee are uh, particularly concerned about. This organisation has an important role in seeking to uh, strengthen community justice right across Scotland. And as I've been speaking to the chief executive and members of the committee, uh, members of the board, I've been uh, really quite impressed by uh, what I've learned about some of the details of what the organisation has been doing in its first 20 months of operation. I'd commend the staff um, and the board for the work that they have done, uh, both in uh, seeking to inform the public about community justice, about the benefit of community alternatives. It's particularly, in stri particularly striking, I think, that their second chancers campaign has now been uh, viewed almost six million times. I think that's quite impressive for an organisation um, in its first 20 months of operation. They have also trained more than 1,200 uh, com uh, community justice practitioners. Um, and they've engaged with all 32 local authorities in seeking to strengthen the provision of community justice at a local authority level. That's, that's very helpful. Thanks very much, Convener. Thank you. Um, Mr Johnson, can I ask you about the chair person? I mean, there's been an interim chair. Um, there's no current chair, is that correct? And I understand the advert for the chair went out, was it yesterday? Uh, would, would that have been prompted by today's meeting or can you explain the time scale for this? Seems rather odd. I certainly can. Um, there has been an acting chair for uh, some time. My colleague Neil will be able to confirm uh, when that acting chair was appointed. So when it was uh, recognised that the um, that the ch permanent chair was off and was likely to be off for some time, the board agreed to put in place an acting chair and she remains in place just now. So the board does have a chair. Um, the, um, the, the permanent chair resigned in uh, September 2018. So really following that resignation, we have been working on the process for appointing a new permanent chair. Now, you'll appreciate that it's important that that process is robust. We require to engage with the Public Appointments Commissioner to assemble a panel to think carefully about the skills mix that we uh, need to be, uh, the particular skills that we need to be looking for. So work has been in train um, to appoint a permanent chair. I, of course, am keen that that work is done as quickly as possible, um, and it has gone live, I think, in I recent I understand days. all that, and that's the normal run of things for government. I just think it's rather odd that we find out that the post was advertised yesterday, less than 24 hours before this meeting. We have absolutely taken steps to um, ensure that the post could be advertised as swiftly as possible. Um, and I, my colleague Donna, if, if, if the committee are happy to hear more, may be able to describe more about the process it's we've adopted and why we've sought to accelerate the process as, as much as possible. The process is, is of less concern to me. I have some sympathy with your problems with governance because it's so important to get the right people on board. But leadership, this committee has identified over the, the months and months I've chaired it, is absolutely key to any the, the driving forward any organisation and the problems we have with the criminal and community justice system in Scotland. So to leave a chair vacant for so long and then for it to be advertised less than 24 hours before this committee meets just seems rather worrying. 
Donna okay. McKinnon. Uh, to be clear, the, the post was not advertised yesterday. It was the beginning of last week, and the guidelines around the timing have been completely in accordance with the code. We began the process for recruiting a new chair um, as soon as we heard about the resignation of the previous chair. And we've taken steps to look at a skill set to try and attract as much uh, diversity amongst candidates as possible. Uh, we got an independent assessor. We had planning meetings prior to Christmas so it's entirely there's there's been no delay whatsoever and we've um, public appointments team and indeed the independent assessor from the commissioner's office have uh, prioritized this recruitment alongside myself to know thank you for that clarification Ms McKinnon Liam Kerr thank you <coughs> thank you convener good morning uh, convener has just been talking about the importance of getting the right people on board and Donna McKinnon you uh, you were talking about uh, the, the skill sets now uh, we heard in your opening statement Mr Johnson that there are four new non-execs that have been appointed uh, and now uh, there's a, a move to build a skills matrix. Um, do you have any thoughts on why it's been done that way round? Shouldn't a skills matrix have been built and a skills review undertaken before you recruited the non-executive members? Well, we need to be... Uh, I, well. To be clear, we have been looking at all points about the skills that are required for this board. Uh, my colleague Neil may be able to say more, or will be able to say more, because at the outset, we prepared uh, documentation around the skills that we needed for the board. So we were very clear about the skills mix that we needed from the outset. So at every point of recruiting, uh, we have sought to uh, be to set out quite clearly the, 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 the skills requirements. There may be, Neil may have more detail about that, if that would assist the committee. If I may interrupt, before you ask, I think you're going to ask, answer this question, but just so I can be absolutely clear for anyone uh, watching. So when you were looking to recruit the four new non-execs, uh, did the Scottish Government do some kind of analysis of the skills gaps that were, were there already? Is that yes. where uh, we're at? Um, what happened was before the original recruitment of the, the, the initial board members, a skills matrix was prepared in dialogue with the, the previous chair. Uh, and then ahead of the, the, the more recent recruitment round, in the absence of the chair, uh, a discussion happened with the, 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 the whole board around the skills requirements uh, for the, the recruitment process, and that fed into uh, the, the recruitment of the members. It is good practice once a recruitment round has happened as part of the succession planning and part of the planning of the board to undertake a further assessment of the, the skills on the board once you have the people round to try and assess who you have and what the skills are and whether there are any gaps. So it happened both before the recruitment round and then again after the recruitment round as is, uh, as is good practice. Thank you. And can you give the committee some idea then of the, the current makeup of the board in terms of its skills and diversity? And specifically, uh, in the Auditor General's report, uh, there were concerns about whether there was sufficient experience in relation to uh, finance, governance and risk management. So uh, what is the current situation and are you comfortable that now those three specific areas have been addressed? Uh, yes, we are comfortable that the, the board has um, uh, a sufficient mix of, uh, of skills, although we're going to talk about some uh, further activity that's been taken. In terms of the original four board members that were, uh, that were identified, they include people with uh, extensive uh, public body board experience and also third sector uh, board experience. Uh, including one who was the, the chair of a, an audit committee of a, uh, another public body board. Uh, it includes people with uh, business experience, people with experience of the, the criminal, justice, uh, criminal justice system as well. When the, the skills analysis was undertaken after the last recruitment round, the main gap that was identified was around direct experience of, the, uh, of delivery within the community justice system, and that was responded to by having uh, a, an, a, an advisor placed on the board, initially a senior uh, female social worker, and then more recently a, a senior former uh, sheriff. For the, the four new board members, they include people with a, a mix of experience across the uh, community justice system and across the justice system and other areas as well. So it includes someone who's a, a former prison governor, but also a chair of, uh, of SASO. It includes someone with research experience. It includes someone with experience of working with uh, young people, uh, vulnerable young people. Uh, and it includes uh, um, someone with experience of working within the, the third sector as well. So there are a mix of 
different experience, both in terms of um, uh, finance, audit, and, uh, and also direct experience of the community justice system. As part of the arrangements, now that, that uh, those eight board members plus the advisor are in place, the board has been looking at its skills requirements, uh, and along with internal and external audit, arrangements have been made to provide uh, additional training, for example, on audit and, uh, and risk, and that process is ongoing. That might answer my next question, which is just uh, the, the recruitment's been done. Uh, the board is now full. You're now doing a, a skills matrix. What happens if you identify some specific gaps uh, that lead you to say, well, wouldn't it be great if we had someone like this? Uh, what do you do then? Um, we're content that the right mix of skills are, are on the board, but as with any board, they should be constantly reviewing the skills that they have and the experience that they have and responding to that by undertaking additional training, uh, and that's what's happening on the, the board. Uh, final question, just a slightly different uh, focus, if, if I may. The Community Justice Scotland is uh, part of the Scottish Government's strategy to shift uh, the balance from custodial sentencing towards community sentencing. Uh, we heard from Willie Coffey's question earlier on. I mean, he, he described it as uh, it's had something of a, a shaky start. Uh, we know the Scottish Government's got plans to, to uh, almost force, to, to bring in a presumption to, to push uh, the justice system towards community sentencing. So, Paul Johnson, uh, are you confident that if that happens, Community Justice Scotland is ready for that? Uh, and has it got sufficient resource, capability, capacity if the Scottish Government forces that change? Well, we're absolutely clear that community sentences are often more effective at reducing reoffending than short prison sentences. And so, as you say, uh, we. Properly, it's got to be. You've got to have a legitimate alternative, surely. Well, I agree that the Community Justice Scotland as an organisation needs to be properly resourced to do its job. And we, of course, are uh, continuing to have regular discussions with the organisation about its resourcing. But let's be clear, it is not the main deliverer of community justice uh, sentences. Those sentences or those alternatives to uh, custody are delivered locally. Its role is largely as, a, as an improvement body, effectively. It is working with the local providers of community justice, um, much of which is financed through our partners in local government and is seeking to uh, support improvement in services and improve the consistency of service delivery of, across Scotland. So it's a vital role, but it's not one that it undertakes alone. It undertakes it with those partners in local government and indeed with a wide range of other partners, including, uh, including for example, the Scottish Prison Service, the Police uh, Crown Office and many other local partners, including uh, third sector and voluntary organisations. And so, in brief, you are comfortable that Community Justice Scotland is ready uh, for this shift? Well, I, I, my, my, uh, what, I, what I think is that Community Justice Scotland is already delivering on its agenda, uh, but in its first report, its first annual report, which is currently out for consultation, it does show that when you look across Scotland, a lot of work remains to be done in terms of improving the availability and consistency of community sentences. So I would not wish to sound in any way complacent. I think we have got a big challenge ahead of us in Scotland to ensure the uh, widespread and uh, more consistent availability of community alternatives, given what the evidence states about the effectiveness of these uh, sentences. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Bill Bowman. Um, in the evidence we got in December, the auditor told us that the accountable officer was intending to appoint someone to strengthen the financial team. Have you appointed that person? So I think that would be a reference to the work that the uh, Chief Executive of Community Justice Scotland has been taking forward to strengthen the finances. She is the, Karen McCluskey is the accountable officer of Community Justice Scotland. Um, my colleagues here have been in very regular contact with them um, to ensure that the financial capability that they need is in place. And my colleague Neil may be able to provide an update on just the latest position with regard to that uh, support. 
Yeah, just to confirm that Community Justice Scotland has been receiving shared service support both uh, from our finance colleagues uh, and on a more informal basis from our uh, accountancy uh, colleagues. Uh, they've been in further dialogue with them uh, around getting some additional support and we as the sponsor director have agreed some extra resource to help them with that. They're looking to, um, in the initial term, uh, to look externally to bring someone in uh, and then beyond that uh, look at the possibility of a secondment, secondment from within the Scottish Government to help with that work. So that, that work is in active progress now. There's also a uh, dialogue with both internal and external uh, audit uh, around under sorry with internal audit undertaking a review of uh, both governance and finance within Community Justice Scotland, and the outcome of that uh, will feed into further dialogue to identify what the skills gaps are and how those can be strengthened. So does that mean no? It means yes that the the necessary uh, that uh, the necessary skills are in place, but we're looking to further strengthen them. But I think the conclusion from the evidence session was you needed basically an accountant in the organisation. Yes. That shouldn't be too hard to do. No, and that has been put in place for the the relevant time scale that's required. But what for is? The, I mean, we've spoken about it takes from September till January to put an advert out for a board member. I mean, how long does it take to appoint? An accountant in an organisation. Uh, we'll make sure that that's in place for the, the, the current accounting period, so we're working on the basis of making sure that, that that resource is in place when it's required. I still don't think I understand. You need an accountant, you appoint an accountant. What are you actually talking about? We've made re resource available. The, the organisation is going through the process of having that, uh, that person uh, put in place. So that would be an external appointment? It, it, I think what they're looking at on this, in the immediate term is to bring in uh, someone on a contract basis and then we'll look to put on a, a more permanent arrangement. I think from what is said else earlier, I mean, it seems to take an awful long time uh, to appoint someone. And this is not a director level. This is you know, a working accountant who just needs to get on with doing the books. Yeah, and that's, so that's sitting with the chief executive who's moving forward with that. Thank you very much. Daniel Johnson. Thank you. And can I begin by thanking colleagues on the committee for welcoming uh, the cuckoo in the nest, so to speak, this morning. Um, I'd like to really follow on from what Willie Coffey and Liam uh, Kerr were asking. Um, in Scotland, we have an incarceration rate of 140 uh, per 100,000 population. That's a third higher than many other comparable OECD countries and a third higher than it was uh, uh, 20 years ago. So I agree with the strategic importance of the work the community just does. But is it not fair to say that there is going to be a step change in what we ask it to do with the introduction of commissioning by Community Justice Scotland? And given the concerns here, is the, the board, and, in, and more importantly, Community Justice Scotland more widely, ready to take on that role? Well, I, I do not dispute uh, what you have said in relation to our incarceration rate and our need to make uh, real progress and to step up the availability of community alternatives. My colleague Donna may wish to say a little bit more about some of the priorities that Community Justice Scotland are pursuing, but um, I think we can have confidence that the uh, steps that have been taken to strengthen the governance oversight and um, the finance of the organisation will stand it in good stead for the challenges that lie ahead. Because I agree it's important that this organisation is in uh, fine health to take on uh, the challenges that we face. Yes, so as, as Paul says, um, a key priority for Community Justice Scotland will be the, to adopt a strategic commissioning framework and they're doing that in conjunction with local areas and doing a lot of consultation on that, what that might look like in order to maximise resources locally and really get people working in partnership for better outcomes. Another priority will be to, we touched on it earlier, alternatives to prosecution and really I think a, a, a large part of the groundwork has been done through Karen McCluskey's championing up and down the country on that to, to get people um, in line with policy directives of pass uh, presumption against short sentences and the management of offenders bill as well. So I think uh, communications engagement up and down the country will help uh, going forward um, in terms of commissioning and also um, strengthening the evidence around alternatives to prosecution. I mean, given Paul Johnson that you set out some successes which I, 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 I wouldn't dispute. You would acknowledge that that, that commissioning role will be a, a major step change in, in terms of what Community Justice Scotland is being asked to do? Well, 
that it's an important aspect of their role, um, but I think it's important to emphasise that Community Justice Scotland will not be the direct provider of community justice um, uh, sentences. That is not the intention. Rather, they are supporting uh, local uh, partnerships with the commissioning of those services. So I, I would see it as absolutely an evolution of their role um, and as part of that importance of ensuring the uh, better more effective, more consistent availability of community sentences across Scotland. Um, but I just think it's important that we don't think that the organisation has gone from its current size and is about to you know, become a, a sort of massive provider of community justice uh, disposals across Scotland. That's not, that's not the case. It will simply be seeking to support the local providers. Sorry, can I just get you to clarify? I mean, either commissioning means that they are commissioning services or they're not and, and commissioning doesn't imply provision but it does imply uh you know looking at, at providers looking at what will uh, would be delivered and deciding whether or not to, to give the money that that is what commissioning means and that's substantially different from the work that it's currently carrying out well, my understanding is that it's, it's working on a, frame, a framework mm -hmm. for commissioning to enable local commissioning to take place. But again, Donna, perhaps you would have more to say on that. Yes, so um, given what that organisation is now tasked with, there is a long lead-in time for this. Um, we are helping in the transition from Scottish Government to Community Justice Scotland to do that. And a crucial part of that, as Paul has indicated, is a commissioning framework, essentially a good practice guide. So that's a, an, an important first step. And then indeed after that, um, we have actually given Community Justice Scotland extra um, resources to enable them to take commissioning forward. As I say, there's a long lead in time. We haven't just give it to, give it to them their first year of operation, for example. Well, just, just finally, and in terms of the, 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 the success and indeed the strategic priorities for the board, um, as a member of the Justice Committee, we have heard um, both from third sector organisations and, and indeed from sentences themselves that there is a, a great deal of confusion as to actually what's available in terms of community sentencing. And as long as that remains the case, and as long as sentences don't have confidence in terms of what's available to them, there is going to be a, a significant problem in terms of actually getting that, 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 that sea change in, in uh, uh, sentencing to, to take place. Would you agree that that is a key strategic priority? And, and do you believe that Community Justice Scotland is equipped and making progress towards that awareness and understanding from sentences. I absolutely agree that it is a key priority for Community Justice Scotland to support the more effective and consistent availability of community sentences. I think what they've already done through the uh, first report that is now out to consultation is actually give us possibly a clearer picture than we've had previously of what the, what our country looks like in terms of the local availability of community sentences. I think that's a first step towards identifying priorities for improvement, and that's at the heart of their role. Thank you. Very much. Do members have any further questions for our witnesses this morning? Okay, c can I maybe ask a final question? Uh, Mr Johnson, you'll see that Parliament believes very strongly in gender balance on their committees and uh, bodies. What is the current gender balance on the board? So at present, the board has uh, six men and two uh, women mm -hmm. and is therefore clearly not yet meeting the uh, aspirations that we have for uh, gender balance. Uh, it is a real priority uh, of the government, as you, as you know, that we seek to achieve gender balance in all of our public bodies. Um, and it's uh, something which I wish to raise with a new chair um, immediately on the chair's appointment, really uh, to ensure that there's a, a focus on uh, developing uh, greater gender balance and greater diversity across the board, really, um, as this uh, board takes its work forward. There will be um, at least two further opportunities for members to join Community Justice Scotland in advance of the date when the Gender Representation Act comes into play. So there are opportunities, but it needs to be a real focus of attention because we know that diverse boards are uh, very likely to be much more effective boards. 
Thank you very much indeed, Mr Johnson. Can I thank you all very much for your evidence this morning? Before I suspend, can I welcome to the public gallery the Honourable Max Savono Thomas and colleagues from the Public Accounts Committee of the House of Assembly of Turks and Caicos Islands. And I would now suspend the meeting uh, briefly for a changeover of witnesses. Thank you. Item number three is major capital project. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning. I've just counted there are seven of you and seven of us, so uh, <laughs> that's a, a good match. Uh, Alison Stafford, welcome, Director General of Finance. Rachel Guillon, Deputy Director, Infrastructure and Investment. Alan Morrison, Capital Accounting and Policy Manager in Health, Finance and Infrastructure. Of all from the Scottish Government. Then Bill Reeve, Director of Rail. Michelle Rennie, Director of Major Transport Infrastructure Projects, Transport Scotland. Peter Rickey, Chief Executive Scottish Futures Trust. And Kerry Alexander, Investment Programmes Director from the
the Scottish Futures Trust. I understand that Alison Stafford is going to make a brief opening statement. Yes, thank you very much, convener. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to attend to assist the committee's scrutiny of the latest report on the Scottish Government's major capital projects, which we submitted to the committee on the 2nd of November and also published on our website. Um, as the convener has just introduced us, there are a number of colleagues here. Um, Michelle and Bill will be very much able to assist with um, responses on transport questions um, broadly and also on rail. Peter and Kerry are here very much to support the committee's inquiries on non-profit distribution hub and the schools programme and um, Alan to help with the health inquiries that you have. These were the three areas that you were particularly flagged that you were interested in. The committee may be interested to know that the current format of our reports was the product of a tripartite consideration involving the then Public Audit Committee, Audit Scotland and the Scottish Government. Uh, this report has stood us in good stead over many years and has evolved to include some further information on infrastructure investment, including major infrastructure <coughs> programmes as well as projects. The autumn report, which came out in November, gives that six monthly update on major projects over £20 million, including the local economic benefit that is attracted and generated by each project. Just want to mention also the spring report in 2018. Uh, those spring reports regularly provide information from the annual infrastructure investment plan progress report. And over the last year, that report additionally included an overview report in response to the interest that the committee had shown in infrastructure investment more broadly. This is us responding to your inquiries and providing the information that will help you with your review. That overview report contained details of capital spend beyond that invested by the Scottish Government, details on private sector investment leveraged into our infrastructure investment programmes, an overview of financial transactions, and a breakdown of the total investment in our project pipeline by year, sector and funding. It also included the revenue commitment position on our 5% affordability cap and the profile of revenue spend for MPD, the non-profit distributing model, and hub projects, including the associated net present values. So there's a wealth of information there. To put these reports in context, they are a collection of projects and programmes to really make a step change difference in our inclusive economic growth. They are projects and programmes led by organisations across the breadth of the public sector in Scotland. The responsibility for the delivery of individual capital projects and programmes remains with the relevant accountable officers. And given the span of infrastructure projects, if the committee has a detailed inquiry from a sector that's not represented here this morning, then I will endeavour to write with the additional information where that's deemed necessary. So that's a brief introduction. Before handing back to the convener, I will pass over to a couple of colleagues who need to declare non-financial interests with regard to the committee's business this morning. Thank you. Peter Rickey. Thanks very much. I'm, yes, I'm Peter Rickey. I'm the Chief Executive of Scottish Futures Trust. I do need to declare this morning a non-financial interest as a director of Aberdeen Roads Limited, the MPD company established to deliver the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route project. Okay. And Ms Stafford, did you say someone else? Kerry yes. Alexander. I also have a non-financial interest to declare in Galliford Tri Extrix Inverness Limited, which is the special purpose vehicle which runs the Inverness College NPD project. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to ask Colin Beattie to open questioning for the committee. Thank you, Vera. Obviously, the main objective is to maximise the value of our uh, infrastructure in terms of uh, its usefulness to the economy. Could you comment on the overall affordability of public sector infrastructure where it's privately uh, financed? Of so, um, the, the whole area of affordability, so the infrastructure investment plan sets the context for all investment that takes place and the decisions that are ultimately made by Scottish ministers in putting forward budget proposals each year. And um, our budget, as you know, is made up of a whole range of different ways of financing infrastructure investment. You've asked specifically about the privately financed, and those are the ones that, as you recognise, have a number of years where the government continues to pay on a revenue finance basis. 
the method that the Scottish Government has adopted to make sure that it maintains an, uh, that level of investment on the revenue finance in a, in a way that is affordable is to voluntarily in put in place a cap on those revenue finance elements um, year on year. And that cap is set at 5%. You will see actually from the budget that was um, laid out to Parliament in December that the basis of that cap has been revised. And that's so that we keep it absolutely in step with that affordability and with the changing nature of what's captured by that cap. One of the big triggers for revising it was the different treatment due to classification changes of the regulated asset base for the rail network. And that required us to look at it. And we keep these policies under review. But the 5% cap has been the methodology for testing and ensuring that, that affordability. And that um, trajectory is set out in our budget documents. It's something we've published for a number of years now so that there is a transparency around that. So that's the method that we use, is this 5% cap. Now, obviously, it's very important to maintain a certain level of infrastructure investment. What's the impact going to be now that the MPD model is presumably going to be discontinued? So you are right, the MPD model, um, because of classification changes again, um, no longer gives us the additionality. Uh, it was extremely useful at the time, and particularly in response to the crash in 2008-09, the programme that followed that was really essential for actually maintaining and contributing to some economic growth when it was really tricky for Scotland at that time. But the MPT model um, is, is by very virtue now discontinued. What we are seeing is that we are still making a level of investment that um, our next year budget, as you will see from published documents, is in excess of five billion. We continue to use a whole range of other um, financial tools at our disposal, not just traditional capital grant, um, but also a range of other financial instruments. So those are actually able to underpin our commitments that we're setting out in the budget for next year. And there is work to look at what other models will be suitable going forward. That will be essential to uh, be part of that um, ambition that was set out in the programme for government by the First Minister in September for the National Infrastructure Mission. Um, and in terms of the sorts of models that we're looking at, I could invite Peter Rieke to say a little bit more if you'd like to know a bit more about those detailed models. It would be interesting to know what we're looking at. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. Um, the, as Alison said, the forms of private financing of infrastructure or any sorts of financing of infrastructure that we can use to deliver additionality requires a private classification under these Eurostat rules that we've talked about before. And the, the latest version of that rule book is a, a 150 pages published jointly by Eurostat and the European Investment Bank um, that, that in 2016. And that sets out a relatively narrow track of the sorts of structures that can be put in place. And the, the, the Welsh government uh, were actually going to adopt the Scottish non-profit distributing model to deliver the same sort of additionality and they had a program that was in planning when the rules changed and have evolved their model to, uh, um, to be a profit sharing model and they now call it the mutual investment model and that has been assessed by the Office for National Statistics and now by Eurostat as being privately classified under this new latest rule book. So we're exploring um, opportunities around that similar sort of model to see whether there can be an, an um, a version that would work in Scotland that's likely to be very similar to that mutual investment model that, that the Welsh Government has adopted. And it's important that that both is able to gain a private classification, but also that it's suitable to deliver the sorts of projects that we want to use it for and that the industry will respond positively and will tender and be able to offer um, good value to us and, and it is able to deliver sustainable business for the construction industry as well. So. We're undertaking a little bit of, of engagement with the marketplace at the minute to understand the acceptability of those um, arrangements to the market, um, mainly the construction market, but also financiers, along with um, looking at some of the details of the structure based on the Welsh mutual investment model. Could, could I maybe just ask you a slightly different angle on this? I mean, I, I was looking at the weighted average cost of capital and the internal uh, um, rate of return. 
I wonder if I use the internal rate of return uh, as opposed to the modified internal rate of return, because it seems to me it's the modified internal rate of return might be more accurate. There's quite a lot of different ways of measuring the cost of capital um, on individual projects. And the, we've used the weighted average cost of capital. We've used an internal rate of return. Um, the, a modified internal rate of return is not something that's widely used in the sector, and it's not something that our um, the financial models that the consortia put together and that the financial advisors for individual projects look to. So um, the... I don't, I'm not able to sort of run a discussion with you now about a modified internal rate of return versus an internal rate of return, I'm afraid, because the, the, the factor that we use, we've used weighted average cost of capital and internal rate of return, and both of those have been um, published now. But the, um, the way that the phasing of the different uh, sorts of financing projects, the senior debt and the junior debt come in, and the, the difference in the weighting is something that can affect differences between those two those variables, um, but I'm not in a position to um, to comment on whether a modified internal rate of return would be more accurate measure than an internal rate of return. Okay. Alec Neal. Just picking up that last point, obviously there's been this debate laid by on one side the Cuthberts and on the other, I think, SFT about how you measure the effectiveness of NPD. And I don't think we can go into the detail of that here today, but one of the important points is that any successor programmes, obviously, we need to be absolutely sure that we're ending up with a, a proper reflection of the, of the best way to fund. Mm -hmm. Um, can I just go back to these change of rules because they're pretty fundamental in terms of their impact and you say they're from Eurostat just as a matter of interest if and when we get Brexit uh, do we still have to abide by Eurostat rules? So um, let me uh, start this response and I may again invite Peter to come in so Eurostat um, producer um, um, managing government debt and deficit, and that, those are the rules, in effect, that uh, create the context. But Eurostat don't invent the context for their rules. Those, those rules are actually set at a much higher level, and they actually originate from the UN. Um, and so if we're respecting of the UN and the principles that they use in terms of their um, national statistics that they set out as the guiding principles for any any nation across the globe um, who are part of the UN thinking, then those actually set the parameters for how governments are seen to be competent and do business um, in, in this sort of space. Uh, so the Office of National Statistics, which obviously is the the UK wide body, there isn't a specific uh, statistics body for us in Scotland, we come under the Office of National Statistics. Um, they um, will fulfil a role, um, as, we, as far as we can see, that will continue to take and interpret what comes from the UN and see how that should apply for, to classification issues for anything that's managed under public finances within the UK. Okay. So I don't think, you know, the short answer is I don't think by one bound we are free. Um, but I think, you know, if there's anything that you want further, Peter, have you got anything that you would add? Because I know you work um, closely with these organisations as well. I, I think that's exactly right. The, we need to have a set of rules. Um, and um, as Alison's talked through the, the, the international sort of hierarchy of those rules, and, and I can't see a very quick change coming in the detail of the rules that we will have to apply. Can, can, I, can I say, Alison's explained this to this committee before, and I was aware of just what she said, but I just wanted to check if these specific changes fall into the UN category, or are they purely Eurostat? Because some things are just Eurostat, and some things are informed by UN rules, and I just wanted to check, are these, is this particular change informed by the UN changes? Yeah, the, the, the UN at that sort of level sets a series of principles and the, those principles are worked through in details by the different statistical authorities and you're, you're right to say that the detailed guidebook that I've referred to is published by Eurostat but that is, is set to embody the principles um, and 
we have no information that the ONS would seek to embody those principles in a different way um, through any, um, any changes. Just, okay, I, I, I don't just, want to dwell on this no, too much. But. Just, just the last point to say is that I, it, I think it's fair to say that it relies on those um, experts that are in the various statistical authorities, whether it's at European level or at national level for, for the UK. They actually have to take what comes from the UN and they have to interpret it. And as we have seen, those interpretations, how it's actually then captured in the in the, the Managing Government de Deficit publications that come out, and then even how those are interpreted is a, is a skill and a science or an art form even all of its own. So I think the, the only fair answer to say is we will have to wait and see. Okay. Can I move on to a, a wider subject? Now, I mean, obviously, I'm very interested in the, how we achieve the national infrastructure mission in the general terms. Alison, you've provided an answer. Um, <coughs> can we clarify where we're at, excuse me, in terms of the National Investment Bank and when can we expect the National Investment Bank to start raising money for infrastructure projects and what will be the relationship between the National, uh, between the Scottish Futures Trust and the National Investment Bank because, and, and indeed Scottish Enterprise because there's an element of overlap I would have thought uh, across the board. So where are we at with the National Investment Bank What's its relationship to SFT and, you know, is there, is there any impact on the role of Scottish Enterprise, particularly in lending to businesses or investing in businesses? Okay, um, I'll start and give you some overview and then I shall bring in um, others as necessary, Rachel and Peter. Um, in terms of the Scottish National Investment Bank, a bill will be introduced early in this year, in 2019, to establish and set the sort of financial arrangements for the Scottish National Investment Bank. So that from 2020, the bank will be investing in our businesses and communities. So that's, that's a specific time frame. Um, the uh, headline in terms of the relationship with Scottish Futures Trust then they actually will be operating in very different, with different clientele. Um, the Scottish National Investment Bank, um, in terms of establishing that, will um, be using financial transactions. And the requirement in that particular use of our budget is that it is actually applied for organisations that are actually outside the public sector boundary. Um, so they have to, it has to be used with private sector. Um, the Scottish Futures Trust actually supports a tremendous amount of our infrastructure delivery um, through public sector areas of activity. Um, so just to address those particular areas, in terms of the current landscape of other activities, then there are discussions that are taking place about um, those areas that would fit more readily within the scope of the Scottish National Investment Bank. And I know the Scottish Enterprise are having really constructive conversations with those establishing the bank to work that through. Um, but I would just turn to colleagues in case there's anything specific they wish to add. Peter, do you want to start with the... Um, the relationship or the, the different space of activities across the two. I just build on Alison's point. The the SFT doesn't operate as a provider of finance. We operate with public sector bodies across Scotland and interfacing with the private sector to innovate and deliver structures that are financeable and to then manage programmes of activity through delivery of infrastructure. The Scottish National Investment Bank will be a provider of finance. And as Alison said, there's a, a range of areas providing finance to private sector entities in which it can work. And so in our work in coming up with um, ways and means of financing projects, it may be that some of the ways that we're able to develop will be suitable for the SNIB to provide the finance to. And we'd work very closely with them in that in those cases, but there's a lot of the work that we do with public bodies where it wouldn't be possible for the SNIB to provide that sort of financing. So there's definitely no <coughs> overlap and um, there is great um, synergies in terms of how these um, areas will complement each other. Sorry, Rachel. Um, yeah, just a couple of points on that. Thank you very much. So your, the main point of your, the thrust of your question, I think, was about where this fits within the National Infrastructure Mission and how that's financed. 
So obviously this year the legislation is due to go through uh, Parliament setting up the powers that the National Investment Bank will have, which will help you see the context and the types of products and finance they could be looking to provide, albeit that the consultation already out there has said it's um, more independent, as in it's for the bank themselves to choose the products. The budget as well also sets out where the um, money is being made available so 340 million I think before the end of this parliament and the 2 billion capitalisation is allowed for in the, in the plans moving forward. Um, Alison and Peter have already given a pile of, of information but a couple of areas that people will need to be alive to is that the National Investment Bank will need to invest in the private sector using financial transactions in a way that does not affect the classification of any projects that are invested in and bring them back on the balance sheet. So the reason I'm raising that is you and I are both aware that Commonweal and others have put papers out there making suggestions about what might or might not happen that has not really been able perhaps to, to draw out that flavour. Um, and we can come perhaps in the Infrastructure Commission, but that has a role in looking at the future delivery in this landscape. And I say, Jim McCall, our leading industrialist, most successful industrialist in Scotland, has made the point to the Economy Committee last year. Uh, he's very, very supportive of the National Investment Bank, particularly in relation, for example, to export finance and the like, as well as investment. But one of the points he makes is that if it's too constrained by state aid rules, um, as other investment banks are not in Europe to the same to any great extent if you look at the German National Investment Bank for example but he, his concern is that there is you know um, the state aids might limit the ambitions and the and the potential of the National Investment Bank is that something you've been looking into to talk to Jim McCall about his concerns because clearly given his track record as being the most successful industrialist in Scotland we should be listening to what he's saying so um, I think the best thing for me is to just um, reflect back to the programme board, the points that you're raising. Um, the Scottish National Investment Bank actually has a, a programme uh, for its delivery. It will be very much alive to the issues of state aid. I know it is. Um, and um, just to make sure that those particular points, I haven't personally spoken with Mr McCall. I have on other matters, but not on this one. Um, but we'll just make sure that those points are reflected back into the programme board and I'm very happy to do that. Great, thank you very much. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener, good morning. Um, I wonder, we're, we're quite lucky, I think, at this audit committee and been able to see right across the public sector landscape over the years and we pick up common issues and threads in, in, in capital project delivery from time to time. And I'm particularly interested in how we perhaps learn any lessons and share good practice. Um, colleagues will no doubt highlight some examples where some attention needs to be given to delivery of some of these projects, but there are a number of successes too. So I'd like to ask you, how, how is it we, we gather together the examples of good practice and try to share that? We've, we've said this for a number of years at the Audit Committee. That's one of our wishes to see evidence of this. So how do we do it in practice? And I know there's quite a broad range of projects here, most, mostly roads, rail and schools, I suppose. So how do we gather that kind of intelligence? How do we quality assure across the board to improve the delivery of projects like this for Scotland? Okay, thank you. So um, you're absolutely right, it's a very broad span. And um, I've had the benefit of um, working in this space for a number of years as well, um, establishing the Infrastructure Investment Board for the Scottish Government in 2010. And as you say, very early on, um, we part of the work of the board was actually responding to um, <clears throat> areas that this, the predecessor of this committee had flagged up and some of the um, reports from Audit Scotland as well. And building that so capacity and capability and getting a sustained programme of, um, of delivery was really key. And, and as you say, not everything um, works perfectly in this world, but the, the, certainly if you look from the last report that we put out, there are more projects, the majority of projects are on time and on budget. So learning the lessons has been an important part of that journey. One of the things that has happened that is now systematically in place is that for any of our major projects, that there are gateway reviews that take place 
and there are also um, specific reviews through the work of SFT that happen real time as programs and, and um, projects are taking place. These are carried out so that those who are responsible for those projects can get some third party input to just test and review. And actually from that work, there is a centre of excellence within the Scottish Government that captures both those findings of those gateway reviews on major projects as they take place, but also at the conclusion, when there's the last gateway that's taken place. And then there are ways that that information is shared. We find actually that um, whilst there are written documents that capture this, there's nothing as powerful as getting the people that are actually leading these projects together and matching up people at particular times as well with those who have done projects before with those that might be doing them for the first time. So those are our, some of our key systematic ways of doing that. But there will be specific things that happen in specific sectors. So I'd like to ask Kerry to say a bit about what's happened around the schools programme and also to bring in Michelle as well because actually our in terms of our biggest area of spend of capital investment is actually all the areas of transport. So I think Michelle will be able to say what happens in terms of getting the learning and ensuring that we're getting the benefits that we expect from the investments that are made. But if I may, convene a Kerry first. Kerry Yes, certainly in relation to the schools programme, Scottish <laughs> Schools for the Future programme, there's those two elements of real time and also assurance as you go along and also reflective and learning lessons from what's already happened and in terms of the real time being out and engaging regularly with local authorities and what they're doing within their projects and being able to pass that on and, and discuss that with teams as you're as you're working with various project teams in those projects um, and also as you go along being able to do that in each of the assurance reviews feedback those recommendations and take those recommendations when our team and, and Scottish Government and so on are, are working with other local authorities. Um, but also there's a there's a reflective part to that. So there's the local authorities themselves um, performing their post-project reviews and um, post-occupancy evaluations once they are in facilities and thinking back what happened, what could, how did it go, what could we could do differently in the future. Um, and on the schools programme, there's already been an interim report that's been published on what's happened, what's gone well so far, and things to build on for the future. And certainly the team will be using that to look at um, on, on the back of the more recent uh, additional investment into schools that was announced just before Christmas. How can you learn lessons and apply those going forward? On the, um, on the roads projects, we have instigated, in, an, in addition to undertaking the assurance reviews, we have instigated a, a more formal process within Transport Scotland where at the end of each phase of a project development, um, we stop and reflect, speak to our supply chain and our various stakeholders and try and um, record any lessons at that point in time so that that we don't have to wait until the project has completed in order to build those lessons in to our project pipeline later on. As I say, we're doing that in consultation with our supply chain and with uh, stakeholders, and we have um, at least biannual um, meetings with organisations like the Civil Engineering Contractors Association. We also um, pick up a lot of lessons from our regular engagement with communities up and down our, roads, our road schemes across the country. And we offer um, uh, both the, the lessons learned register and um, sort of informal learning with our um, <coughs> project managers and project directors. Um, and we offer that support throughout the project delivery phases. Well, only one brief follow up on that. Thank you very much for, for that feedback. Uh, we used to hear at this committee fairly regularly, convener, you'll remember that perhaps there wasn't sufficient time put into the planning phase of particular projects and that had serious cons consequences there on and that can apply across the board to any kind of project and there was also perhaps not the same amount of attention at the end of a project post project evaluation and review and so on and so forth and we always cried out at this committee to see evidence of that taking place because we felt some of us felt that that was the key to future successful delivery. Would you say that has been the main change and are you seeing that more and more across the public sector that particular attention has been given to post-project delivery to feed 
lessons back in? And are we giving all these wonderful projects and project managers the time to design and deliver, to, to design the projects initially so that we've got a better chance of successful delivery? Um, I, th I think we've heard already some good examples of the post-project um, reflections that have taken place. I think the committee's observation about that planning and investing enough time in that, I think the areas that um, those projects that do perform well have had that investment. I think the uh, trajectory on that of putting more time in there has been improving. There may still be areas where it, it can be better, you know, um, but I think it is something where there, there is some improvement. And there are still things that come along with that have impact on projects. And sadly, where there are delays, it can be some things um, that uh, are out with the sort of normal pattern of things, whether that's bad weather, whether that's contractors who are um, no, no longer able to sort of supply what we expect, um, whether there's particular things when... Um, things are discovered on routes or actually some of it is just also responding to local communities some of our some of the things in that planning phase that i think um, are still areas that are likely to give us some variability uh, where local authorities are rightly consulting with their communities about the location say of a school and there can be different sites that are discussed and debated so um, but i think overall we are seeing some improvements in those areas in the way that you've highlighted Thank you for that. Thanks. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. I take on uh, Willie Coffey's points about the learning outcomes, and I want to look at some specific issues uh, that particularly involve the North East. Uh, first of all, the AWPR. Uh, so I guess I'm addressing my comments to either Peter Rickey or Michelle Rennie. Um, one of the, the... The AWPR has been significantly delayed. Uh, there were two basic reasons that seemed to be floating around in December for that. One of those was uh, a contractual issue. The contractual nexus between the various parties involved uh, hadn't been uh, sufficiently bottomed out to, to open the road to do the handover. Uh, could you explain to me, and perhaps more importantly to those watching, what, the, what was the contractual issue? Uh, how did it arise and how do we ensure that in future infrastructure projects it doesn't happen again? Shall I? Michelle Wren. Yeah. Um, the, the issue around delay on AWPR um, is primarily related to um, delays the contractor has told us about are primarily related to weather, um, to delays with um, the programming of certain uh, utility works and delays in relation to, more recently, delays in relation to defects that have been identified on the Dawn Crossing. Contractual issues, Michelle Rennie. I, I don't I, disagree with yeah, what you I, say. I, specifically I, I, on the contractual issues, what went wrong, why did it go wrong, uh, whose door is it, and how do we make sure it doesn't happen again? Okay, so I, I wanted to set out the basis of the delays in, in the first instance. The way the contract was set up, it uh, didn't envisage that we would have defects on the, D the Dawn Crossing, um, and I think that's a, a fair reflection of most contracts. They don't, they're not, they're not structured in order to uh, facilitate defects necessarily, um, and although there's a mechanism within the contract for dealing with defects. And the contractual mechanism to which you refer, I think, is that which was discussed at the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, which was to allow the phase between Stonehaven and Charleston to open. That phase was, uh, was identified as a variation to the contract because originally the whole section, including the John Crossing, would have opened up as one phase. So this was to split out that section, that 31 and a half kilometres, as a sub-phase of that, if you like. And that had to be agreed between ourselves and the contractor and the contractor and their lenders as a variation to the original contract. Mm -hmm. So how do we ensure that doesn't happen again? Because to me, as a lawyer that's dealt with these sorts of contracts, that's the sort of thing that can be planned in. Uh, and I think people watching are struggling to understand why that wasn't planned in. So how do we make sure it's planned in in the future for I, infrastructure projects? I don't think it's possible to plan in every possible scenario on a 58-kilometre yeah. scheme. 
the there were the scheme was uh, it was planned to be opened in phases so that the benefits of each phase could be could be uh, delivered once that phase was complete. And um, the Balmedi to Tipperty phase, for instance, was opened in August. Um, and that's a normal part of the planning of these jobs. For that. Had indeed, and had the had the work on the Dawn Crossing not suffered quality issues, then that whole phase would have opened up as one without any difficulty. The fact that the contract had the mechanism and the flexibility in which to create a change to allow the Stonehaven to Charleston section um, showed that it has the sort of flexibility that it needs. The thing that you can never control is the speed at which each organisation manages that process through their own governance. We can control. I'd like to look at this Don Crossing issue, this issue with the bridge uh, that apparently is delaying that entire section. Uh, certainly constituents have represented to me, so I have no particular knowledge about bridge construction, but that this particular bridge, you, you basically turn up, you, you kind of pour it, you put it in place, you move on. So uh, if that's not right... I mean, I accept. <laughs> Absolutely, I accept this is an enormous project. It's a very good project, um, but fundamentally, it's it's putting a bridge in place. Uh, how come this one has gone wrong? At whose door does that lie? Uh, and again, how do we ensure it doesn't happen again? I, I think um, I, I'm interested at your representation of the simplicity of the construction of the bridge Simplicity. because I but think... How does I, it not I, happen I again, think Michelle? The, the contractors wouldn't see it like that. Um, the, the fact that these defects have been picked up is a function of the robust quality management process that's in place on the bridge. And they were picked up prior to opening the bridge and they were picked up during construction. Um, and the, these defects will be remedied at no cost to the taxpayer. Um, and, and the remainder of the road, what can be opened, has been opened, delivering significant benefits. And in fact, um, some of the feedback that we've had uh, said that uh, the, the section that's opened already is the closest thing that one road user has seen to, has experienced to time travel because of the journey time savings that he's making on a, on a daily basis. So I think what we've shown is that we were able to deliver significant benefits at the earliest possible opportunity, that the contract that we have in place makes facility for dealing with any defects at no cost to the taxpayer and that the quality management system that we have in place is robust and picks up these defects on time before the road is open. I press you on the cost of the taxpayer. Yesterday uh, my colleague Jamie Green asked about the cost and I think it's projected now to be 750 million give or take 745, 745 750. And Jamie Green asked the Cabinet Secretary about this, and I just wasn't convinced by the answer. It wasn't particularly clear, and I just wonder if I might press you on that, because uh, the Cabinet Secretary said there will be no cost overrun, but he said it was subject to, or he said it was because the contractor hasn't yet provided evidence of why an extra amount would be needed. I'm paraphrasing, but that was uh, what I heard. Uh, if that's right, if there is no cost overrun subject to the evidence being provided, is it not possible that there could be a cost overrun on this? Well, each, each of these uh, contracts makes uh, provision for the contractor to make claims in limited circumstances. And there is a, there's a, a mechanism for the contractor to make a claim and there are details that the contractor needs to provide in order just to substantiate his claim. That's not particular to this form of contract. That's a, that's a normal risk-sharing device. Um, and this contract is no different. So the contractor has submitted substantial claims, um, and that has been discussed at the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. And uh, we, ha we are discussing those claims with the contractor and examining the detail. But as yet, we have not been provided with sufficient substantiation to allow us to take those claims forward. And that is why the estimate is currently at $745 million. Thank you. Uh, two further things. I I'm going to move from road to rail now, if I may. I, I suspect, Mr Reeve, uh, you'll be on this. And I'll, I'll be as brief as I can because time's 
running short. I, I believe that there are plans to upgrade four stations in Scotland, uh, which might include Inverness and Ab Aberdeen certainly started, I see from uh, the report. There is a desperate need to upgrade Montrose uh, up in the northeast, which has nothing like the facilities that these already uh, have. And, and in fact, Montrose lags the rest of the stations on that section of the East Coast Main Line anyway. Will Transport Scotland be upgrading Montrose anytime soon? Uh, well, I'm pleased to say there are plans to improve the facilities at Montrose uh, that ScotRail is developing currently, and I can write with more details uh, subsequently if that's of interest. Um, uh, the, the reason for the upgrade is uh, in no small measure because of the increase in service level on that railway, which is a, a very good thing, but it creates more interchange between uh, passengers getting off the stopping services and onto the fast services, so it's becoming a more important interchange. So I think I'd share an appreciation of stakeholders at Montrose that, that an improvement in those facilities is appropriate. Fantastic. You, when you write in uh, and tell me what's going to happen, are you able to give me some concrete timescales? Because I think you, that's what people you, need. I'm certainly content to give you the timescales that, that, uh, that we have. Yep. I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Uh, and the other question I have, again, sticking with you, if I may, Mr. Reeve, uh, in, in this, the report, there's talk about this 200 million that was promised to the North East to improve the North East Main Line. Uh, and at the time it was made, so 2016, there was this promise, here's 200 million, it will shave 20 minutes <coughs> off the journey time down to the Central Belt, uh, and it will be in the North East. It will be between Aberdeen and it will be between Dundee. Now, since the report to the committee has been drafted, the uh, report of Arup has been laid, which I think says if there are various options. If you invest 200 million, you will shave two minutes off that journey time, and I think six of the projects will happen south of Dundee. Uh, so my question to you is, what planning was done with Transport Scotland prior to the announcement in 2016 such that when the Cabinet Secretary comes out and says 200 million, 20 minutes, all in the North East, there is actually a robust base for that. And given the remit of the projects, according to the documents that we have, is to deliver economic growth and encourage people onto things like rail, how will the 200 million improve journey time sufficiently and provide sufficient improvement to the customer experience to be value for money? So there's, 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 there's quite a lot going on there, uh, so let's just take this a step at a time. Um, firstly, uh, the 200 million is an additional sum to the other extensive investments already going on in the northeast of Scotland. So, for example, we have a 330 million project to upgrade the capacity to the west of Aberdeen being delivered uh, as we speak and going very well, I'm pleased to say. Um, the 200 million uh, has the purpose of improving journey time and, and capacity for frequency uh, on the railway between Aberdeen and the Central Belt. And indeed, the Aberdeen Central Belt uh, group involving representation from Tayside and from uh, Aberdeen uh, uh, and across the rail industry is working to establish the best way of using that 200 million to improve journey time. It is not the only um, investment that is contributing to that improvement. So separately, we have an improvement to the signalling capacity just south of Aberdeen, where there's a very long distance between signals, which means a long time between the frequency of trains. Um, and we've also uh, started the introduction of the new high-speed trains on the Aberdeen to Central Belt services. Uh, and those, given their superior performance, are also contributing to the improvement in journey time. Um, so I don't, I don't recognise the, the 200 million specifically against 20 million in isolation. Uh, we've been given the task of finding the best possible investment and the best return for passengers and freight customers that we can get from that 200 million, treating the railway as a system, where the system includes the infrastructure, um, the track, the signalling that's controlling the trains, the capability of the trains themselves, and indeed the timetable. Um, it's the iteration of those things that leads to the right, right outcome. The report to which you refer was one commissioned by that group and is part of the process of development. 
and it focused on what potential could be achieved looking just at upgrading the track, so line speed improvements and specifically some, some issues like uh, redoubling of some bridges. Um, it concluded, and we weren't entirely surprised by that conclusion, that that wouldn't give a particularly good value <coughs> return. Separately, there is work going on with colleagues uh, in parallel with that report looking at issues like the capacity of the signalling and uh, my judgment at this stage, without that work having been completed, is that that's likely to be a more fruitful area uh, of, uh, uh, for investment because we have uh, quite an old-fashioned signaling system between Dundee and Aberdeen. And then turning to, to, to your last point about where will those works be located, um, the railway is a system. The objective is improvement of the... Uh, uh, of the journey time, the capacity and, and, and the freight capacity between Aberdeen and the central belt, it is sometimes the case that the best way of improving a train to Aberdeen is to make an investment somewhere in one of the key, key junctions further south. Um, for example, we have some single track sections between Dundee and um, uh, Perth. Which, um, uh, which we, we are looking at. Um, now, actually, I expect that most of that money will be spent towards the north end of the line because we have some other projects under development. I pick up Mr. Coffey's observation about the importance of studying this carefully before you commit the funds. That's exactly what we're doing. The commitment was that this money should be spent over the 10-year period of the Aberdeen City Region deal, and we're, what, a couple of years into that. Uh, so... Um, I think we're making good progress in a prudent development process um, uh, to be able to meet that commitment, but I'd also just point you to all the other investment that's going on on that route at the moment. Thank you, thank you very much. Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I'm not quite sure which one of you deals with items <coughs> not in the report, but um, uh, you say that the fourth replacement crossing, which I take to mean the Queen's Ferry crossing, um, as of April 2018, was completed. Now, as I've raised this before, as a regular user of the road, when you're bumping across on the hard shoulder at 30 miles an hour overnight, it doesn't seem completed. And I think the Cabinet Secretary um, said work would go on till the end of this year, something like that. Can you please explain why this is in this section now? It's the um, Queensferry Crossing is uh, completed in the sense that it's operational. There are still uh, finishing and snagging works underway. Um, most of those are, uh, and most of those that require traffic management, will be taking place at times where um, times during the night and where traffic volumes are minimised. Um, most and, and you've probably seen it on social media um, in the evening. It's not overnight. I I, I appreciate that there are till, still that there is still traffic. But what we're trying to do is do the work at the times of the day where there is less traffic and we're not doing it at, at peak times. I think my point is, that, I mean, completed in the real world means finished, um, perhaps not signed off in a contract or some such thing like that. Can you give us an update on that and perhaps bring it back to life so we know what is happening and when it will happen? Sure. Yeah, so there are, there are some, as I said, there are some finishing and snagging works that remain. Um, the contractor has uh, suffered some delays as a result of failure of his subcontractors and, um, you know... Do it all now or be an apologist for the in, contractors? In, well, inability to be able to, to, be able to um, identify specialist resource within the time. Their uh, current estimate is that they will be complete by October this year. Can you put it back into the, um, the report then? So we can monitor it? We, we, by all means, we can um, add in terms of the covering material that we give you something that covers this that issue. completed to me. We're, we're happy to provide you with, with uh, regular updates if you, if you wish to. Okay. You further questions, Mr. Bowman? No, that's fine. Okay. Daniel Johnson. I'd like to raise the issue of uh, the new Edinburgh Children's Hospital. It's a £150 million hospital, which is badly needed, uh, as anyone who has used the old sick kids will attest to, that the sick kids being in my constituency. If you Google the Edinburgh Children's Hospital, 
and you go to the NHS Lothian uh, website that, that, that deals with those details, it says it will be open in 2017. If you go to the project page, it says it will be open by 2018. So I think we can agree that this is not a project that's on time. As regards the budget, uh, just back in July, according to Lothian Health Board papers, the Health Board made provision of an £11.6 million loan for working capital to IHSL, which is the, the contractor leading the project. £11.6 million against a project worth £150 million seems a, a very large working capital loan to be made. So this begs the question as to, to whether or not this is delivering value for money. On top of that loan, they also agreed to pay a rental fee to IHSL so they could get early access to install equipment to hospital, which, as I alluded to earlier, should already have been open. Is this project delivering value for money? And frankly, given the, 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 the litany of, of uh, errors which have gone on, both in terms of con uh, failures of contractors the issues with the, the clear issues with the finance, the fact that the external verifier uh, refused to sign off the building uh, in the autumn, and indeed the, 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 the video clips which did the round showing floods of hot water uh, in the building itself. Clearly this isn't going right at all, is it? Question, Mr Johnson, to Alan Morrison, who's in charge of health. Is it delivering value for money, Mr Morrison? <coughs> so the figures that you, you kind of reference, that they're part of... Um, a settlement agreement that NHS Lothian are in discussions with uh, the special purpose vehicle about how to resolve the, the issues that you've kind of mentioned. Um, these negotiations have, have not concluded yet and they are still subject to commercial terms being agreed. Um, we um, is there to identify the, the, the issues that need to be resolved before the hospital is, is open and complete. And um, again, we feel that the, the importance is getting a, a facility that is, is ready and fit for purpose and having that um, uh, done before patients are transferred over is important. It's obviously disappointing that the, the hospital is, is late and behind schedule, but the, 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 the clinical services being delivered at the existing site, we, we still um, receive kind of good feedback that they're still kind of high quality and delivering good patient uh, care. Um, but in the meantime, we're, the NHS Lothian are continuing to work with the, uh, the, the SPV and the contractor to resolve the issues that need to happen for the hospital completes. Can I begin by saying that I think a delay of over two years is more than disappointing. But coming back to this loan of £11.6 million, can I just ask, both in terms of it, its size and indeed its, its necessity, is, is this common practice? It just strikes me as odd. If, if, if NPD deals are about risk transfer, it seems to me that the public sector here is, is, is bailing out uh, failures on, on the private contractor's side. And, and certainly health projects, that it's only one um, that I'm aware of that, that we've had the, this arrangement on the wider NPD programme um, I don't know if anyone else would kind of want to comment on that, but it was, it was principally done because that the, the, there was a dispute over a number of different areas, and it was seen as the, the, the best way forward to uh, get the hospital open as soon as possible. It's essentially, that the, uh, the, the, um, the, um, the SPV and Lothian had a different interpretation as to where the problem lied whether it was in the design or whether it was in the construction of some parts of the hospital. And it was agreed that um, rather than kind of go down a um, court case, which would um, add further delay and further risk to uh, defending an outcome of that uh, particular agreement, that that was uh, a sensible way forward. And at the moment, that is still being negotiated. And NHS knows they need to um, confirm that, that what that money is, is, is there to do is, is legitimate and, and reasonable. And um, the, the fact that it's not been agreed yet shows that the, um, the, the diligence of, of Lothian making sure that it is uh, appropriate for what the, the, the money is intended for is, um, is, is being delivered. Can I confirm that £11.6 million pounds will be lent on a, on a commercial basis at a commercial rate of interest? So that, that is part of the negotiations and it's not been uh, confirmed yet. So that is, uh, so NHS Lothian, within the parameters of the agreement, that some is available, but they need to be content that what they're getting for that delivers value for money. So if, if I look at a contract which has had contractors uh, uh, fail, 
through its uh, that has had such major disputes regarding uh, what has actually been agreed to, as you, you've just alluded to there, and has required uh, almost sort of what's getting on for 10% over and above the, the, the contract value. That strikes me that the, the, there must have been significant failures in the way that this uh, project was scoped, um, uh, contractors uh, selected, uh, uh, and indeed uh, contracted for it. Would, those, would that assessment be correct? Where, where are the, the failures that have led to this situation? I, I, I think these, um, it, it's still to be determined. I mean, one, one thing that we'll need to do is, is review the, the um, circumstances behind it and see if there are any lessons to be to, to be learned from it. Um, the, you know, the whole. You sure. I mean, I, I think that the you know these are these are complex projects, and and, and one thing is that the um, we 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 kind of recognise that there will be occasions when. Um, the, the the contract or, or, or things do not go according to plan, um, and and we need to understand that is that um, where, where the problem is, whether it's in the design of the hospital, whether it's the interaction with the the, the contractor and the SPV, and 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 whether there are lessons that can be applied more generally across the the, the, the health sector. Okay, so my, my final question is a simple one: Do we have any idea when this hospital is actually going to open? Um, we, we don't have a, a, a definite time at the moment. That's not very good, is it? Do you have any further questions on this, Mr Johnson? No. Alison Stafford, you look like you wanted to add something. Uh, no, I think it's okay. been well explored. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, do members have any further questions for our witnesses this morning? Okay, can I thank you all very much indeed for your evidence. I now close the public part of this meeting as we move into private session. <laughs>